Hello everyone, Panzer J back with a new video. In this video we're going to cover a game that I've just recently reacquired. Um, it's from Milton Bradley. It's their Game Master series, and this game um, came out in 1986. It is Fortress America. Um, and if and this came out again in 1986, and that's when I originally purchased it, and then I had gotten rid of my copy over the years, and um, only just has have recently reacquired it. So I thought we'd take a look at this. Um, the Milton Bradley Game Master Series, all the games came out in the mid-80s, and there were five total in the series. Uh, the first one was Axis and Allies, which I've covered. I still have my original copy for that, and I covered Axis and Allies in one of my earlier videos. And that came out in uh, either late 84 or early 85. And right at the same time, they also released two others in the series, Broadsides and Boarding Parties, which was um, basically you took on the role or your opponent of pirates, a pirate ship, and a crew against um, a warship. So it was like a one-on-one -on -one, um, game. And that was a lot different than um, anything else that had been out before then or since then. The game I remember came with... Um, uh, two uh, large um, ships, and uh, you had a, a crew on each side, cannons, you know, all that stuff. You maneuvered around to try to uh, get your cannons targeted on your opponent's ship, and then once you got close enough and kind of rammed each other or whatever, that's when the uh, boarding parties part of the game came in, and you like actually assaulted um, your opponent by go, getting onto their ship and hand-to-hand -hand combat and whatnot. So that was the second game. Um, and then another one that came out at the same time as Axe and Allies and Broadsides was Conquest of the Empire. And that one was set um, back during the Roman Empire. And it's kind of at the tail end of the Roman Empire where uh, things are starting to fall apart a little bit. Things are starting to fracture. Maybe a little bit of civil war is going on. And in that game, you can take on the role of one of six um, Caesars vying for control of the Empire. And that game was cool in the sense that, I mean, you could form like temporary alliances and whatnot, but it was basically every man for himself. I don't want to get too much into Conquest of the Empire because that's the other game that I, from this series I just recently re reacquired. So we'll be doing a video on that one here pretty soon. And then those were the three games that came out. Um, in the initial run around, like I said, 84, 85. And then the last two that came out in the series were both from around 86, maybe the very beginning of 87. And that was this game here, Fortress America, um, and Shogun. And Shogun was set in feudal Japan. It kind of had a little bit of a Conquest of the Empire feel in the sense that it was like every man for himself. Um, you had samurais in that game. You had ninjas. Um, some pretty cool stuff. I haven't gotten that game back yet, but hopefully um, down the road. And then the last game that they did in the series, which is kind of unfortunate because these games were really popular, um, and I wish they would have kept going. There's a lot of other you know, conflicts they could have covered. The cool thing about this series was uh, prior to this, a lot of board games from like Avalon Hill and some of the other older uh, gaming companies they used uh, cardboard cutouts, cardboard counters for to represent the like the units and the and the pieces in the game. So you would have just like a you know a generic a little cardboard counter. You know, obviously information would be written on it and whatnot to represent you know you know planes or tanks or men or whatever. But that was pretty much across the board what um, the old war games had at that time. And then when this Milton Bradley Game Master series came along, they started using, you know, actual uh, plastic playing pieces to represent, like, the units in the game. So that, that was, like, a, a really cool kind of, like, upgrade from what had come before it. But on to Fortress America. So this game, it came out, like I said, in 86, maybe the very beginning of 87. So at the time, it was set in the future, which not anymore. Um, the game at the time was set in the early 2000s, so around 2005, maybe 2010, something like that. So roughly about 20 years in the future was set 
at the time of the of the game being published. And the concept is that the United States is kind of on its own, no allies, and is facing a three-pronged invasion. So the United States has um, has a bunch of satellites orbiting in space, and they've equipped each satellite with a laser, um, not for offensive purposes, but for defensive purposes. But that still has drawn the ire of um, most of the rest of the world, at least the United States opponents. So they've kind of banded together to uh, invade the United States. The game has a a, a really uh, feel like the uh, mid-80s Red Dawn movie, the original, not the crappy remake. Um, and it feels a lot like that, where the United States is being invaded and um, they're kind of on their own with no allies fighting back. So one invasion front is over on the East Coast, and that is the Euro-Socialist Pack, which in essence is the Soviet Union. And they are attacking uh, the East Coast. Then you have um, on the Southern Front coming up through Texas and New Mexico and Arizona, you have the Central American Federation which is a alliance of a bunch of different nations in Central and South America. And then over on the West Coast, you have the Asian People's Alliance. And again, that's just like an alliance of a bunch of different um, Asian uh, country or nations in Asia. Um, I, I would assume China would be in there. They don't specify exactly uh, what nations are taking part in each of the alliances, um, other than uh, the Soviets dominating the Euro-Socialist Pact. But you can kind of think back to 1986 and uh, some of the uh, enemies, um, or at least some of the countries you weren't so friendly with in Central and South American Asia, and you can kind of draw your own conclusions as to what countries might be uh, participating in this invasion. And so the United States is on its own. Canada has remained neutral in the conflict, so mercifully no invasion of the United States from the north. Um, so they're fighting on the three front, um, three fronts here. So it might seem like the United States is at a severe disadvantage, and they're in all kinds of trouble, but they do have a couple of um, unique advantages that the invaders don't have. Um, one of them is partisans. So, um, in the course of the game, um, the United States um, has the ability to raise partisans. And so those can pop up behind enemy lines and disrupt and cause some problems for the invaders. And the other um, advantage they have, the unique unit, is the lasers themselves. They have, um, once per turn, they get to put a laser on the board. And that has the ability to fire at any target it wants. Uh, it could target any of the three invaders and any of the three invaders' units. Um, so they have the ability um, for each laser that's on the board to have one um, hit against an invader's unit. And that's really powerful because obviously you can target, since you get to choose as the Americans what you're targeting, um, you can go ahead and try to wipe out their most the invader's most powerful units. Um, with the lasers, though, they have to be placed once, uh, one in each city. So you can't, like for instance, you look up here, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, um, they're obviously well away from um, the invaders to start the game, but you can't just simply load up your lasers in Minneapolis or Milwaukee. You've got to spread them out. They only can be one per um, U.S. city. And on the board, there are 30 U.S. cities. Um, not only are they named, such as obviously New Orleans down here and Houston and San Antonio, but you also have these city markers, um, which are placed on each of the uh, cities. So you got those as well. A little out of focus there, but you got those as well. And so for the 30 U.S. cities, you would be able to place a laser per per city. Um, you're definitely not going to get to the point where all where you got all 30 cities um, with lasers on them. Not only because the invaders will have some of the cities, but the game would not go on that long. 
So obviously, as the U.S., your strategy is going to be to be placing um, the initial lasers that you get as far away from the invaders as possible. So again, in the Midwest, you know, maybe Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago, Milwaukee, India, uh, Minneapolis. So those are the two uh, big advantages the United States gets. One other inv advantage is that uh, each side starts out with 60 units. Um, and the units are the same for each of the, each of the four, uh, each of the four participants, the three invaders in the United States. Um, they all have the same units and all, and the units all attack and defend at the same. So it's not like the U.S. has better, you know, helicopters or the invaders have better infantry. They're all, they're all the same as far as attack and defense. And there are five different units. And they have uh, infantry, tanks, mechs, uh, copters, helicopters, and fighters. Those are the jet fighters. Those are the five units that each of the um, uh, participants has. And again, they're all the same across the board. So for the U.S., the initial setup is of their 60 units, they've got to place two units per U.S. city. So again, there's 30 U.S. cities, so the, there's their 60 units. And there's no... Um, there's no set way in which you have to place your units. You can, it's two per city. That's the only requirement. So you can put, you know, two infantry in a city, two tanks and infantry in a, uh, jet fighter. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's, it, that's solely up to, um, the United States player, but he's got to place two per, uh, city for his 60 total units for the invaders. They, again, have the same 60 units, and it's the same number of units um, as well. 24 infantry, I believe, 12 tanks, 12 mechs, that's 48, and I believe maybe 8 copters, and what would that leave? 4 jets. I think I'm off a little bit with the numbers. Maybe it's 22 infantry, because I'm pretty sure you get 6 jets, uh, 8 copters, and maybe 12 or 10 each of the tanks and the mechs. But anyways, the bottom line is you get 60 total units. So for the invaders, they get to place 20 of those units to start the game. Eight infantry, uh, four tanks, three mechs, three copters, helicopters, and two jet fighters for their 20 units. And where they place them is depending on who the invader is. So over here, we've got the Soviet Union attacking the East Coast. And right here, you have invasion zones. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six invasion zones. And you can place the 20 units in any of the six invasion zones. Again, any combination that you want, but no more than five units per invasion zone. Um, and you don't have to have anything in some of the invasion zones. Again, it's totally up to you just with the one um, rule that you have. You can place no more than five per invasion zone. So they get 20 initial units invading, and that's the same for each of the three invaders. So the same thing over here in the south, uh, 20 um, units from the Central American Federation. Again, the same combination of... Uh, Eight infantry, the three mechs, the four tanks, the three helicopters, and the two, two jet fighters. And again, the same thing for over here on the West Coast with the Asian People's Alliance. And then subsequently after that, for the remaining 40 units that each of the invaders has, they come in in waves. So every turn is a new wave, and eight units per wave get to come in subsequently. So it's going to take you, after the initial setup of 20 units, it's going to take you five turns to get all 60 of your units into the game as the invader. And again, the only rule that you have to follow for each wave when you're bringing in your, your eight replacements per turn is just that you can't put more than five in an invasion zone. So for the next turn, um, I could bring in eight eight hover tanks if I had eight to still place or whatever. So any combination of, of what you want to bring in, just, um, just limit yourself to only five per invasion zone. 
So unlike the initial setup where it actually specifies what the breakdown of the 20 units, it doesn't make you um, bring in certain units for each eight that you're bringing in per um, subsequent turn. So it's, it's any combination of the eight that you want. So that's basically the initial setup. And the victory conditions, um, at the end, the U.S. always goes last each turn. So it goes from the West Coast down to Central America, over to the East Coast, and then the United States. So you're going to start over here on the West Coast first as the uh, Western Invaders. And as you can see, there are several cities right, right away in danger from... Um, the uh, the invaders um, invasion zone. So you got Portland up here in the north. You got San Francisco and Los Angeles down here. So the goal for the invaders is to take 18 U.S. cities. So 18 of the 30 cities they need to win the game, and they need to have those held at the end of um, the United States' turn. So at any point at the end of the U.S.'s turn, if the invaders own 18 cities, uh, they win the game. And the other cool thing about this is, is it, yes, the invaders are working together to um, bring about the collapse of the United States, but they also it, you can also have an individual winner even among the invaders. So it's based, based on victory points. Um, cities are worth a certain amount of victory points. And then you also have spread throughout the uh, the United States um, different symbols on the map that represent different types of resources. So you've got uh, oil resources, agricultural resources. So those are also worth um, a certain amount of victory points. And then an, um, one other way the invaders can score points is by taking out lasers. And how they take out lasers is they simply... Um, occupy the city that the laser was in. They don't get to use the laser themselves. They just basically, in essence, capture it and hold on to it. And um, that's another way they can generate points. So if the invaders have 18 cities at the end of the U.S. turn, the game goes on for one more turn with obviously an invader victory. But with that one additional turn, the invaders can kind of turn on each other. And uh, one more turn of gameplay allows them to gain some extra resources and extra victory points to determine who the ultimate winner is. So that's kind of the premise of the game. Now, from what I have uh, remember back in the day and from some research I did, it's uh, the United States actually wins more often than, that, than not. Um... It's difficult for the invaders from the point of view that, I mean, on the East Coast, there's a bunch of city uh, objectives that are within striking distance of um, the Soviets. Um, but down South, there's a fair amount. And in the West Coast, again, there's a couple right on the West Coast itself. But then after that, you get into a lot of empty territory here. So uh, especially for the, inv the Asian invaders, it's, it's difficult to get the necessary... Um, cities for the victory. Now, for the invaders in general, obviously they start out the game um, stronger than uh, than the United States. The United States starts out with no lasers. They do get one per turn again, but they start out with none. So you're going to want to, you know, kind of go um, hard and heavy right from right from the start. Now, the game does determine which uh, units you can bring in for the for, for the initial setup, but then after that, for the eight units you're bringing in per turn, you're going to determine on your own what you want to bring in. And obviously, you're going to want to bring in your most powerful units right away. So basically, on turn two, for your first eight uh, reinforcements, they're pretty much going to be all like aircraft. The most powerful unit in the game is the jet, is the uh, jet fighter. That's the most powerful unit in the game. And then second probably would be the helicopter, the attack copter. And then you have the hover tank. 
So that's a little bit of a, a futuristic um, spin on tanks. They're actually hover tanks, not just uh, simple um, tanks. And then we have the mechanized unit. And then the least powerful would be uh, the infantry. So you're going to want to, on turn two, when you're bringing your, your eight initial reinforcements, you're going to probably go pretty much all aircraft. You're going to, you're going to probably bring in the maximum number of fighters that you have left, uh, copters and so forth, because you've got to take out the U.S. as, as quickly as possible before they start building up a bunch of different lasers um, spread throughout the map. Because again, as the United States, you get to choose your target. So with the jet being the most powerful, if you've got, you're going to definitely choose a jet as your target. And then depending on which invader is having the most success, you're going to probably target them. So a few turns into the game and you've got three, four lasers on the board, you can try to take out four uh, jets just on that one turn. Each laser gets one, gets one shot. Not a guarantee that you're going to hit, but still at least you're going to try. So as the invaders, you're going to want to bring in your most powerful units um, first. Probably by the time you get to the last wave, um, the fifth wave of your reinforcements, you're probably down to just like all infantry at that point because you've probably brought in all your most powerful units first. And with the invaders, once their 60 units are done, they're done. So they don't get, um, they don't get to respawn any of their units at all. So again, um, each invader has either six or eight uh, jets. I'm not, I can't remember offhand, but let's say it's six. So once the, uh, over here on the East Coast, once the Euro Socialist Pack has their six fighters uh, destroyed, that's it, they're done. So um, they've got, each invader just has 60 units to accomplish their mission with. And once a unit is destroyed, it's destroyed. That's a little bit different with the United States. With the United States, they have the same 60 units to start the game and the same configuration of those 60 units, but they can respawn um, dead units depending on the draw of a card. So the United States gets these cards here, and they draw one per turn. So this card, for instance, says uh, Farm Machinery Converted in Minneapolis. So in Minneapolis, you'd be able to put two mechs and a helicopter down. Um, let's take a look at another one here. So here we've got Angry Rebels band together in the Plains sector to repel the invading hordes, place units separately where possible. And we've got the silhouette of three partisans and three infantry. So in the Great Plains region... And there are five regions of the map itself. So the Great Plains, obviously, we have here centered around like Kansas City, St. Louis, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Chicago. You'd be able to place three infantry and three partisans, you know, where applicable separately. If not separately, then they could go in the same territory. So the U.S. gets one of those cards per turn. And depending on if they like, there's there's way they can ways they can generate additional cards like recapturing cities and whatnot. So that's the way that the 60 uh, U.S. units can kind of respawn, depending on, you know, the card they draw, what the card says. Um, so that's also a, a pretty big advantage for the United States. Obviously, the game would have to go on long enough for you to generate enough cards for that really to make a difference. But at least it, whereas you're in the U.S., if you lose, let's say, your six jets, there's a possibility that, you know, you'll get some of them back depending on the card you draw. Now, things like the Jets aren't going to pop up as often on those cards. They're, you're going to mostly get some of the lower-end units, like the, the infantry and the max and partisans, but still, nonetheless, you can get your units um, respawned during the game. And again, with the, uh, the major regions, you've got the west over here, uh, south, uh, plains. you got the east coast up there. So... There are, and you've got the Rocky Mountains over here. So those are the five regions of the United States, and sometimes those cards will direct you to place them. You know, it doesn't have to be place in Houston or place in Tampa. It could be, you know, in one of the five regions, and that gives you a little bit more leeway uh, where you place the units. And then we've got the uh, reference card over here. 
and this just specifies the the uh, action sequence per turn, uh, the combat results table, um, the units and their specifications as far as what dice what um, dice they roll, um, their movement ability, the order of the casualties are taking. Um, there's three different dies, um, six, eight, and ten sided, depending on the unit you have. Here's a look at the uh, laser. And these are going to be set up once per turn, so I can stick one there in Minneapolis, let's say. If I was um, playing this game now and had my first U.S. turn, I would assume that's where most U.S. players would place that. You know, maybe turn two, stick one here in Milwaukee. And there you go, you got a couple of lasers on the board as the United States. So, again... So let's say I uh, we are two turns in. I'll use that Minneapolis um, laser and shoot at this uh, Soviet Union jet. And uh, depending on the die roll, take it right out. And there you go. The Soviet Union has one less jet to uh, um, to uh, attempt the conquest of the United States with. And then each uh, each uh, side gets their own uh, tray here. Uh, the compartment for each of the units that are involved, and you also have these um, markers to uh, represent um, territories acquired by um, the invader. The last unit we can look at here is the Partisans. They're a little bit different, the sculpt for um, the U.S. Partisans. And those, again, those pop up here and there depending on um, um, what the card says to do. There is one uh, terrain uh, feature that does affect combat, and that's, excuse me, that's the mountain area. So anywhere there's a mountain terrain on the map, that's going to aid the defender. Also, cities also aid the defender. So cities and mountains, everything else, there's no um, advantage to the defender um, during the course of the game, it's just any mountain um, territory and any city will uh, be a plus one, I believe it is, for um, the defender. And that applies if, like, let's say the invaders take a territory or a city and the U.S. attempts to take it back, then the defender or the invaders would then um, enjoy that uh, benefit of the, of the defense. So that's a look at Fortress America. If we look at the box cover, you got old Saddam Hussein there on the cover. Again, this came out in 86, so maybe it's uh, a little bit of fortune, fortune telling there, considering we uh, went to war with Iraq just a few years later. So that's the front. Let's take a look real quick at the, uh, the back of it. And this is the, the back of the box. Yeah, just kind of giving you some um, a look at some of the different units involved and stuff. So it says, shape the course of the future in a few short hours. Decide the fate of America and the destiny of the world when you play this 21st century strategy game. So there you go. That's a look at Fortress America. Um, I'll be back in a little bit with the uh, second game that I've just recently reacquired. And that is Conquest of the Empire. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, trip down memory lane. I definitely remember having a bunch of fun playing this uh, back in the day. And hopefully we can uh, get a new game of this fired up pretty soon. And we'll let you know how it turned out. Take care.